Welcome to World Rowing's Coastal Race Module Keynote Series. In this session, we're looking at on-water management, float plans and navigational hazards. My name's Gwyn Batten. I'm a former Olympic silver medalist and coastal world champion, and it's great that you're here. So let's get going. In this session, we're going to be primarily looking at the planning part of safe management of a water session and in it very much focusing on the float plan itself and the navigational hazards. We're going to also look at methods for calling for help and some signing in, uh, signing out and signing in systems. There's a task also embedded into this keynote which you can do with your tutor um, or you can do that um, on your own. So let's get going. We just take you back to the previous session where we looked at the various stages around managing a safe on water session. And you can see here part one, which is the planning, the pre-planning that's done in the time before the outing, primarily anything between two weeks to 24 hours prior to the session, this planning would take place. And this session is primarily focusing on the elements that make up the information that you would put in that float plan. Please bear in mind, depending on the nature of your outing, whether it's a quick 15 minutes where you're not going anywhere further than 100 metres off the beach versus a three or four day expedition journeying along the coastline where you may be going up to three, um, three kilometres offshore, um, the float plan will be very different in scale. But we're going to take you through and we're going to give you examples with the big and small. So hopefully you'll really enjoy this session and you'll learn a lot. So what is a float plan? At its most simplest, it's the basic information of where you're going, what boat you're in and who's in that boat. And probably really important to that is when you're coming home. At its most sophisticated, it's a plan which involves timing gates for tides where you may be going around headlands to avoid tidal races. It may and which may and your journey may stretch over a multi-day tour itinerary. So huge, complex touring, journeying all the way down to some really simple. The most critical information is the information that helps the club. All the search and rescue services find you if something goes wrong. So while a float plan is good, a shared float plan is even better. So what's in, let's look a little bit more deeply on what's in a float plan. Okay, so the key bit here is about what route you're taking. Now this may take the form of GPS coordinates, it may take the form of compass bearings, or it may take the form of line of sight. So for example, line of sight might, might mean that we're going to go off round to um, a certain buoy off a headland and return back into the estuary of the river. How long you expect to be away is really important and your estimated time of return is probably the single most critical bit. And so unless you've actually physically planned the route that you're going to take, it is very difficult to estimate what your return time is. So again, hold on to that. The next bit is to assess the weather information. Now, whether that's the wind, the wind direction or the wind strength, whether or not that's um, swell that's coming in and which may affect the height of the waves. It may also mean the nature of the waves and the direction of the waves onto certain beaches or around certain headlands. Very important for all types of rowing is visibility. So it's those types of features that are really important to assess when you're building your float plan. To combine with those, you'll also need to understand the tides and the effect, if the effect of those tides on the currents and how they affect shallows, rips, races, overfalls or whether or not you're in a wind over tide situation. So again, it's a multi-layer of information coming together. And of course, if you're in an area where there is it's a high tourist destination or a high um, 
um, industrial destination um, location, you may find that other river users and marine traffic would play a part in your float plan. In many countries, if you are near a um, shipping lane, it may well be worth your while looking for notice to mariners. Emergency shelters and who to contact for help are important to get in your float plan. And then how are you signing in and signing out? Who are you signing in? What's the system that you're using? OK. And of course, in your float plan, you'll include your, your technical coaching and your training details in that as well, in most cases. So let's have a little look at some examples. The example we have on the left here is for a, a um, full day of rowing with a touring um, training, training plan. We're going through um, from a location near the Isle of Wight. The stretch of river is stretch of sea is called the Solent. Um, it's a particularly um, challenging for both um, busy marine. Uh, there's two harbours there, so busy um, commercial shipping in that location. There is also quite strong tides and also the wind being on the edge of the Atlantic Ocean. Winds are pretty significant. So there's quite a lot of detailed information that would go into that, um, that float plan. Float plan, which might be for a typical club endurance session, where you may be going off for um, a couple of hours and you might be doing a little bit of endurance or beach work or, or some such stuff. Um, this example of the middle one here. So this one here, this is an example of a, a session um, out of Exmouth um, and who's in the boat. What you've got here is what the aim of the session is, um, the timeline of when the team, when the crew need to be at the club, what time they would depart, where their trip is, so where they're going along the route, and this is a line of sight on here, um, and then um, estimated time of return at the club beach. And also it goes into what equipment, so what boats are there, what the safety boat is, um, what the personal um, safety equipment would be held up by the cox and the crew, and also, interestingly, sunrise and sunset, just to make sure the crew don't get caught out, low visibility. Um, tidal information is quite important around um, Exmouth because of the um, huge inland um, area of water estuary running up to Exeter, which causes very, str very strong um, tidal sections, which of course then affect the shallows, um, the shallows which in turn cause waves. So you can see a good bit of detailed planning here. And then you can see the example on the right hand side. This is an example of the beach spin training. And this is typed into typed in through an email um, on the phone. And it's much more simple by nature. But again, it has a similar features when when the session is, the aim of the session, who's in the boat, which boat's being used where the location they're training from. And so this is their journey, which is Town Beach, and they're gonna stay with 250 meters of Town Beach. High water, just in case there's not enough space on the beach, etc. Direction of the wind is an important factor in here, just in case it's offshore or onshore. Um, and they're identifying that the beach lifeguard is on duty. And you can see, again, timeline for when the um, crew would need to meet and more detail about what they're doing. And interestingly here, it's a 90 minute session with an ETA at 5.45. What's great by putting it on the phone is that you can then email it to, not only to the crew um, that are coming down for training, but you can also forward it onto um, your, forward it onto a key individual within the club so they know exactly where you are if you don't return at this estimated time. OK, so those are some great examples. I'm going to share with you another example, which is, is used from a slightly different um, community. This is a community of the Welsh Sea Rowing Association. It's a fixed seat community. They do do some FISA offshore um, rowing as well. And you can see here they have a template um, which they use in their clubs. And it's actually got an interestingly for me here is there is a mixture of a float plan alongside the dynamic risk assessment. They call it a session specific risk assessment here. So they're assessing the rigor, the weather and the conditions. And also it has in the corner up here, some of the key controls linked to the generic risk assessment. 
um, for um, water um, for the for the boat class and for their for their training groups. Now, also, it's worth noting in this session, they also have an accountability line or an authority line. So who made the dynamic risk assessment and then who checked the dynamic risk assessment? So it's really interesting that they have this authority line in here. And I think at the end of the day, um, this particular um, community of rowers are rowing in some very um, exciting, but also some very technical areas of water, very close to the um, North Atlantic. The waters can be quite cold during the winter um, and in the summer as well. Um, also, the tides around there can sometimes be between six to eight metre tidal ranges. So as you can imagine, they've got some quite complex and sophisticated planning that needs to take place if they're able to go and do the rowing that they do on such exciting stretches of water. I would um, absolutely encourage anybody who has an opportunity to, to visit um, Wales. It's a beautiful country and has an extremely deep maritime history. OK, so let's keep going. Let's now look at navigational hazards. So there is a real wa wide range of navigation. There is a real wide range of navigational hazards that need to be considered when you're making your plans. And for some of you who have been brought up on the sea and ha are, have huge experience of, of, of we're operating on the sea, these will be just a reminder. And I'm sure the depth of knowledge that you have will far su supersede what I'm going to share with you today. So what are navigational hazards? Well, examples are shipping lanes, anchorage, firing ranges. I personally have been caught up in some firing ranges. So again, don't don't disregard those. Navigational hazards might include shallows, sandbanks, reefs. Um, you've got out, outcrops of rocks, wrecks, headlands, strong currents we were talking about before. Anything above two knots, um, I would consider is, is meaningful um, in terms of um, impacting the journey time of a rowing boat, which is roughly going at about five knots at cruise pace. Tidal overfalls, tidal races, tidal bores on some of our rivers. Um, you've got refracted waves off um, harbour walls and these also may also affect wind over tide. You've got the beach wave dynamics on the beaches, so it might be dumping waves, it might be rip currents. So what are the features near where you are that um, would affect your planning and your risk assessment? So let's take a little look. I've chosen this wonderful, beautiful picture off the internet. It's a beautiful picture. You would desperately want to go rowing there. I can already imagine a beach sprint event coming down off this beautiful beach here, the afternoon sun as the crews race out and back along this lovely um, gr deep green um, sandy bottomed water. But if I would look at see instantly looking at this photo, I see three main um, navigational hazards. The first one being just over here, you can see there is a, a reef break. Um, so this is identifying to me that there is coral on here. Coral's very, very sharp, very unfriendly to both the bottom of rowing boats and to the bottom of your athlete's feet if they need to step out of the boat, if the boat runs aground in that space. Um, so critical point to um, ha present a no-go zone in this space here. Um, the next thing for me that I can identify from this picture is we've got some um, boats here, motorboats. Now, whether or not those are fishing or whether they were tourist or whether they're private boats, but there may be some commercial fish, commercial marine operations going past here. Um, and again, it's very important to understand the movement of those because, you know, as we go backwards in rowing, the ability to maintain a good look, look round all the time is sometimes more difficult to do. So commercial shipping, the reef breaks on here, and also, you know, there are, if you can look quite closely, there are rocks as well around. Um, so again, the isolated rocks potentially coming in here, there is potential some risk associated here. Maybe that you have athletes on the, on the sand and there may be rock or coral 
actually on the sand itself, which could cut their feet. So real range of, of risks associated with this. And, you know, one that, that isn't so visible from this picture potentially might be the marine life um, and whether or not it's um, stingrays or whether or not it's certain types of fish which you may have the unfortunateness to step on or brush against. So we've, that's that's one little look. Let's have a little look at an, another another popular training location. So this is Exmouth. Um, it was um, an example of, of, of one of the float plans that I shared with you earlier. And the, the rowing club is actually located here. Um, it's got a lovely, um, nice ramp and then onto sand, straight down onto um, the water here. So not too difficult for them to, to push their boats down. They do have soft sand, so they have launching trolleys that go with their, their quads. And you can see here the key hazards that I can see in this space um, are primarily the River X as it comes through this narrow um, location here. There's a quite big expanse of water up um, in this area leading up to Exeter. And as this water up with the tide drains in and out of the entrance here, the harbour entrance, the tidal speed um, current is particularly high. The novices, novice crews, that is um, an important factor, especially for the duration of the session um, that they may be partaking in. The next one is, of course, there's quite a lot of um, marine traffic in here with the harbour and with the use up here. And you can see that the actual navigation channel itself is quite tight. And so the marine traffic is restricted by its draft into quite a narrow space. And then finally, the really next big navigation hazard really in this is this, this shallows. This is all a fantastic, um, beautiful stretch of um, sandbanks which dry out at low tide. Um, these sandbanks protect the um, this coastline here, which is a southwest facing coastline, which would take quite a brunt of waves. This sandbank protects those big ocean waves from coming in. But as a result, these waves tend to break on the shallows here. And so you may be paddling quite peacefully along and all of a sudden a breaking wave will appear out of nowhere, 500 metres from shore. So those shallows become quite a, a technical um, bit of local knowledge for the rowers. So what else do you see? Let's look at the next um, picture here. This is Torres Beach in, in Portugal. It's going to be, it's the... Um, destination for the 2021 World Coastal Championships and for the 2021 World Beach Sprint Finals. Um, and the question is, why don't you take the opportunity now as a group or on your own to look at that and perhaps Google it um, on the internet and find out what are the navigational hazards um, for that beach. I'm going to leave you guessing on that point and I'm not going to share those with you, um, but it's really worth seeing. I can see I can see about four um, and a couple of them um, aren't in that picture. And if you go on to the Internet, you'd be able to pick up a few more navigational hazards that if you were taking a crew to that location to train or to race at, that you would want to prepare them um, for. And you would also do in your planning, in your float plan. OK, let's move on. Weather. OK, so critical one here is the difference between the forecasted weather and the actual weather. Um, so what is often forecasted when you're doing your float plan may be very different when on the actual day or hour that you go afloat. And that's why we undertake a risk assessment. So you're considering temperature, whether it's air temperature, sea temperature and the combined effects to cause chill factor. Um, whether or not you are um, looking at the wind direction, direction, strength or impact on the water itself, whether or not you have local winds that build up, you have perhaps mountains um, close, close to the shoreline, which would impact on those winds. And I think the key bit for me that many people miss out is when they're looking at the wind direction is to understand that there is some challenges for both onshore waves, which um, can make it add risk when you are approaching and you're landing on exposed beach versus an offshore wind where there if 
there is a mistake in, and you have a breakage on the boat, you may be risk being blown significantly far offshore um, before rescue can come to you. So again, just really thinking your location around the impact of those waves, height, length, set, type of waves, and those effect of the waves on the tide, okay, on the tidal current, um, and the effect of the tide on whether it's on a low part of the beach versus a high part of the beach. Visibility in rain and electrical storms. You know, what are, you, what, what are the real challenges in your stretch that you're training your young athletes or your athletes on? So if I look, there are some fantastic places for you to be able to get your information around your weather. Um, it's absolutely amazing now compared to where we are. And wherever you are in the world, you can have some form of weather forecast. Much of these are, are predicted modelling. And so they're not as accurate as, as local, um, local meteorological offices, but they are incredibly helpful. Um, here's one that I use. Um, I, actually, um, I actually have the professional app here and it allows me to look at any place in the world. It's called Windy App. Um, and you basically type in the location and I've typed in um, the, the race venue in Portugal here. Um, and you can see here it's giving wind direction, wind speed and wind and the wind speed of the gusts. Incredibly helpful here. Um, it's also giving you temperature, nice neutral temperature there. So I'm not so worried about that. You've got the um, waves here. So what you've got is the um, is the wave direction here. So you can see the general direction of the waves, which is typical for Portugal coming in from that space. Oh, blimey. Um, you've got the wave speed, okay, um, the wave height rather, and you've got the wave period. Now the period is the, the time it takes from the peak of the wave for the next peak of the wave to come in. So that's actually quite a nice, um, that's quite a nice um, gentle rolling swell coming in. You've got here, you've also, this is the current. So this is the tidal current because, of course, remember, we've got quite a big open expanse of the estuary that runs into Lisbon. Um, and you can see here the direction of the um, tidal current and speed. But as you can see, it's quite wide in this stretch here. So the current is quite um, low in, 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 in speed. OK, so it's not too, too significant. And again, always a useful bit of information, especially in the graphics set. You can see here the um, high tide and low tide. So low tide is at 8.10 um, and high tide is at 2.25. And you can see it's um, minus 1.4 meters and plus 1.4, which means add that together and you get the range. So what you have is 2.8 meter range um, of, the, of the, the tide on that location. And that would make a big difference of where the waves are breaking on the beach, because actually the, the waves will move up at least two or three to maybe 100 metres up or down the beach. So you can see here, this is the direction of the wind and this is the um, direction of the swell at that time. What's quite interesting as well, because um, in this particular app, there's different models and these are models from all over the world. Um, what you're always able to do when you're doing your float plan, when you're doing it um, a couple of days before your session, is to look at how closely the models are, con uh, are agreeing. So you can see, I would say it's pretty accurate um, for the weather forecast tomorrow at 5 p.m. because the majority of models are agreeing with each other. Sometimes they're very spread out and then you know that the predicted wind conditions or weather conditions are going to be highly likely to be very different to what actually takes place. So that's a great example of, of, of an app that you can get on your phone um, and it would help you in the planning stages and in the dynamic risk assessment stages as well. So let's talk about tides. So for some of you that know about tides, this will be a bit of a recap for those of you that um, perhaps um, are on the Mediterranean or inland seas where there's very few tides. Um, this might be very new to you um, and a nice to know because you don't have to operate on a stretch of water that has particularly big tides. But really, in essence, 
in a the majority of tides basically come in um, and go out so they basically travel in for six hours and they travel out for six hours you have two high tides in a 24-hour period and two low tides in a 24-hour period um, when the moon and the sun are aligned or when they are um, directly opposite each other in the sky you get spring tides because the pull the magnetic pull of the moon and the sun is stronger and those are called spring tides and it means that the tidal ranges will be bigger where you have the moon is a half moon where it's at, um, you will have less magnetic pull so the tides will be neeps okay and the difference between the low tide and the high tide is the range. So you can see the neap range is much lower than the, high, the spring range. It's really important to learn how to read tidal times. OK, so you can see here you've got low tide is, is at um, just after 3.30 with a, with a height of 0.95 metres. OK, so just um, about a metre off, off the measurement. The bottom measurement high tide is near 10 o'clock and it's running at six meters okay so if you took one meters away from the six meter you get five meter tidal range so it's really important to learn how to do this the big one to get caught out is in countries where you've got daylight saving make sure you have made corrections for daylight saving okay so that's reading tidal curves and tidal times. Let's go and look at what it looks like in terms of tidal currents. So again, we were looking, talking there about the up and down. Um, for in countries that have um, tidal currents, you'll be able to find tidal atlases, which will tell you which direction the, the, the sea is flowing in at various points before or after high water. So you can see this point here is high water minus six. So that is at six hours um, before high water. You can see this one down here. It's high water plus one. So what high water and it's one hour after high water. Um, this is a particularly exciting um, tidal atlas that we have in Great Britain off a place called Portland Bill. And I must admit on one occasion I, I came through here in a touring um, f in a touring boat and instead of going round Portland Bill which has some notorious um, overfalls here and tidal races we just rode straight into the beach and carried over that little stretch and then carried on our way so there's a beauty in the boats being as light as they are so that's the old-fashioned way with tidal atlases um, and then the modern way if you get yourself a um, electronic chart um, like this one here from Navronics um, you can you will find that there's tidal um, little tidal diamonds on them and you can press on them and you can actually then get the direction of the tide so you can see here is goat island which is in southwest ireland and you can see here that the tide is is running out and it's running at 1.4 kilometers an hour so some great um bits of, of being able to work out where the tidal currents are and what they're doing for your planning. That's really helpful. So let's little look at how these um, tidal um, currents call, could be potentially problematic in certain, depending on the journey that you've got planned. So tidal races. So tidal races are areas of very rough boiling water that take place primarily where the tidal currents have been squeezed together where headlands are positioned. So you can see here the um, direction of the current is running quite openly spaced. As it gets to the head of the headland, it tightens up um, and it will start to run much faster and there'll be more boiling of the water. And what you'll find is the seas get rougher um, to row through. Now, for What's interesting to note is many deep draft boats may then have to um, travel offshore a considerable way to avoid the race. Um, often, if you do your homework well, there's often an inside passage just inside between the land itself and the edge of the race where the um, tide 
is slowed down considerably by the the shallow um, the shallow water. So my suggestion is this is only for very experienced rowers and for um, people that know exactly what they're doing. So always be aware of what's going on. And if you are um, attempt, um, wanting to go round a headland, always go round with the flow rather than against. And if you do get pulled into the tidal race itself, it will spit you out eventually. Um, so that's tidal races. Let's look at tidal overfalls. Now, tidal overfalls, you'll see those in many stretches uh, of water, especially in rivers um, where the current, the river current, the fluvial current um, can, can set up overfalls. And it's really where the, the current is coming down, uh, the shallow pushes the, um, pu pushes the um, stream further up, and behind which overfall starts to happen. Now, those overfalls can st set up into standing waves and be quite, um, quite significant even for larger um, vessels on the water. Or they can be really tiny um, and be a bit of entertainment to play in. So again, just look out for overfalls. You'll see them everywhere. Where water is, where water's moving, you'll see them all over the place. Okay, and again, tip from me is if you're passing through large overfalls only ever do it in the direction of flow um, if you're trying to do it against the flow you take, you'll be in the overfalls for a considerable amount of time but also if you consider coming in close to land where the um, where the stream may be less it may be less significant so again watch out for tidal overfalls now, if you put the race and the overfall situation in with a strong wind, which is going against the direction of current, you could get some really, really nasty bits of um, bits of water. And so wind against tide is quite important. So if you can imagine that the tidal current is running from left to right and the wind is running from left to right, the wind will actually dampen down. Um, the the waves so it would be smoother than normal and the actual and the sea would be calm and you probably make very good progress if the tidal current is coming from the left but the wind is coming from the right what you'll find is is the wind whips up the the the, the water and you start to get quite rough seas so again be caution be cautious of this especially if you um um, uh, in your planning, when you know which direction your current is running, know which direction your wind will be running. Let's talk about waves. First type of waves worth watching out for is if you have refracted waves, they often appear on the face of harbour walls. So if your club is, is, is a large harbour wall, and there's a likelihood of the ocean waves or wind generated waves being pushed, pushed against the harbour wall. As the energy of those waves bounce back, they occasionally come up into, into peaks. And these um, can at times be pretty difficult. So key thing here is to avoid travelling side on to these waves. because There is um, evidence of, of quad skulls being thrown over and capsizing. In refracted waves. So watch out for um, for harbour walls. Another type of waves are worth looking at is the beach wave. I've got a really nice diagram here, simple diagram of, of the waves, circular waves coming in from the ocean, whether they're wind or um, um, swell waves. Um, they have a crest and a wave trough and as they get closer and closer into the shore they start, the top energy starts to tip over and the wave will break, It'll gain height and then break. And then with that, you get the swash in and the wash back, wash back. Um, it's worth noting the term period, and I think I spoke a little bit about this when we were looking at weather um, forecasting, the wave period is the gap between the tops of waves. All right. There are two main types of waves that are gonna occur on a swimming beach. Um, the spilling wave and then the plunging or dumping wave. Um, the spilling waves tend to op operate on, on 
gently sloping beaches and they're the beaches that we want to really be operating on especially with your beginners and the foam will just tipple over the top of, of the wave. A plunging wave tends to be on a much steeper steeper wave and do watch out for these. We'll talk more in, in later sessions about the challenges of um, doing beach sprints on a plunging beach, a, a beach that has plunging waves. Um, there's a, there is a risk of the bow up ending on here. So that's why it's really important that you um, take time to understand what's going on underneath the water uh, or as you um, can decide which beaches to go on. So that's spilling wave and plunging waves. So a little bit more, I've spoken a little bit about it. So ocean swell, they're waves made by storm winds thousands of miles away and they have this really lovely deep green feel to them. Of course they can get quite big as the waves stand up as they come ashore. Wind waves tend to be caused by the local winds um, and you know, sometimes that's why you may have ocean swell and wind waves coming from two directions so that the waves themselves may be quite chaotic. Um, talk to you a little bit about wave sets. So wave sets are where maybe it's one in every seven or one in every nine tends to have a bigger, a bigger couple of waves and then the waves get smaller and then they get bigger again. And that's really worth watching out for um, because every now and again you'll get quite a big wave um, and that might catch your crews unaware. So different types of waves. So now really just talking about the beach um, environment, um, where waves are operating, you've got um, potentially you've got um, water that needs to get back out to the ocean. And if it isn't necessarily just going back through the backwash and if there are lots of sandbanks on the beach, you may find that there are rips start appearing either on the coral reefs or on the on the beach itself. So really, it's a mixture of things. They're pretty dangerous for swimmers, but they're incredibly useful for rowers. So while, um, and the reason why they're useful for rowers is because at those points, the waves tend not to be as big. Um, they tend to be a great place to row in and out of if you're trying to come through a slightly larger breaking zone. OK, so that's it for our whirlwind tour of waves. Let's now look at navigational hazard of marine traffic. So with marine traffic, so many different hazards that might appear, but we'll touch on a few in this bit. Shipping channels. So in large, busy areas um, where there is not particularly um, a huge amount of water, the um, navigation of, of the ships, they're put into different channels. Um, classic ones, there are some real classic ones in the Baltic, there are some ones in the English Channel um, and this one here you can see in this particular slide is of the um, Greenwich light vessel, so this is in the English Channel and you can see there is um, where the pink arrow is, is the direction of the channel, the lane and then where you've got the pink hashed, that's the central reservation um, and really the when you're in those channels, you need to be traveling in the same direction um, of the as the other vessels. Or if you want to cross them, you've got to cross at 90 degrees. It's always really important to look out for other um, local shipping channels and local restrictions. A classic example of one, which is um, a local restriction um, in the UK, um, is when a when a vessel arrives in the Solent and there is a box, a turning box, no other vessel is allowed in, in that spot. So look out for those. Here's another example of a local uh, restriction outside Dover. Um, and you can see here um, there is a restriction of any vessels going across the face of the entrance to what is a very busy ferry terminal. And most um, boats that want to pass across the face of that need to travel one mile offshore, which, of course, for the rowing boats is not um, really possible to be that far offshore unless you are uh, with an escort. So the way of cutting across the front of Dover Harbour would be to ring up the Harbour Authority um, on the um, before you went out for your outing and then pick up a an escort boat that would take you across the front. The reason why they would do an escort boat is because they can't see you on the radar. Um, and by having a escort boat aligned with you, they can follow 
your journey across the face and not have any ferries crash into you. So local restrictions, really worth digging into. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the rules of the road. So there are something called cold regs, which are international um, rules that are about preventing collisions at sea. And in essence, in the simplest term, every vessel must maintain a lookout. They mu we, we must respect commercial vessels. Um, Boats pass red to red, that's port to port, star, um, stroke side to stroke side, um, and you need to keep to the green side. So if you're coming head on, you go towards green or you go towards um, bow side. And again, overtake exactly like um, um, FISA rules, overtaking vessel must keep clear um, of the boat that they're overtaking. So do your research on that, but it's pretty simple. Voyage. Um, it's really helpful to understand the buoy system um, when you're out on the sea. Um, and in essence, there's the buoy systems are very similar to each other, apart from their, um, the buoys that enter into a harbour. In America and Japan, they're one version and the rest of the world is another version. So just keep your eye out on the two different versions. These are the lateral versions, the red and green boys. Um, but they are really, really helpful to understand. It's a great way of um, using those as features to do training sessions between. But again, just watch out for shallows, dangers, and other marine traffic when you're out on the sea. Great thing is they quite often have names and numbered um, so you can really identify where you are and you can use that as a coach to to um, explain the um, route that your crew is going to be taking in a training session. So let's finish, start to finish up now. So we're now talking about emergency shelters. So when you're planning and you're out on the water, if for any reason the weather conditions would stop you getting back to your um, your club beach or your club harbour, it is really worth having key locations along your route of where you know that you would be able to go in um, if there was a problem with the boat. So let's say we were in the middle of a, a 5k outing, we were two and a half kilometres from our home destination and we started to take on water or we broke a load of riggers. Can we go into the beach that we are at or the harbour that we are at? Or is it a closed out place? So there are places where you can get out and off the water if needed. So they're really important to put in your float plan if you're going more than a couple of more than a kilometre away from home. So I want to spend a little bit of time now talking about calling for help. Critical bit. Um, some of the, if we look back at some of the incidents and, and fatalities that happen on the sea, in many cases the individuals or the crews could have been saved um, if they were able to call for help early enough in the incident. So let's have a little look here. We've talked a little bit um, earlier when we were doing the rescue um, drills about um, calling for help if you're swimming, which is the very standard um, single arm raised waving from side to side. So again, don't abuse that when you're waving to your friends back on the beach. So we've, we've talked through that. There's some other examples here, and, I, and I've pulled these, which these are actively used um, in, in offshore and in touring. So on the left hand, number one, you've got a, a whistle, um, because often if you're quite low in the water and you're breathing, you're struggling to breathe for air, a whistle is much better than a shout. You've got a mobile phone. The key bit about the mobile phone is, is it's in a waterproof bag so that you can use it. It's not just tucked away um, right at the bottom. It's in a waterproof bag and you can actually use it. Um, then you've got a marine radio, which is a, a, a VHF frequency and the international channel for, um, for calling for help, which is a Mayday, um, is channel 16. But watch out, in many countries you need a licence for to, to use a VHF. It's not too difficult. In many places it's an online course and then you can get going. Flares. Many, many clubs use flares. Um, they can be used in daytime or nighttime and they're um, great to just strap on a quad behind the cox's seat um, and tucked away in there. And then you've got 
um, a number five, which is a personal locator device, which is a satellite beacon that if an athlete um, is or a rower is in difficulty, they can literally activate the beacon. And this is then picked up by the um, rescue services. So again, let's look a bit when we would use each of those calling for help um, instruments. So again, the wave, the shout, the whistle, I would say pretty much around beach sprints, ideally um, not further than 400 metres from the shore and ideally even closer than that. Um, especially when there is um, a lifeguard or a club event safety cover is in place. VHF radio used very commonly for training, for endurance type training. When you're going beyond 400 metres from shore, you'd use a mayday call. It's good for contacting the marine authorities or coast watch or other vessels that potentially might be um, coming to your aid. Just watch out limited transition distances um, with rowing because you're quite low in the water. Mobile phone, if you've got it in a waterproof bag and you can use it, um, it's great. Um, just have to watch out that sometimes the um, mobile phone signal disappears quite quickly um, as you go offshore. Um, and do work out about text messaging using WhatsApp if you can't get any signal. Um, it's a little bit more stable than using the um, than using just normal standard SMS messages. So flares, handheld um, red flares that you know some of them will burn for sixty seconds and can be seen for seven nautical miles. Um, mini flares, they're smaller, um, tend not to be as visible, um, and they're not classed as. Um, um, solus. So just watch out for those depending on whether or not there's any coding that you're required to have by law. Um, we'll talk a little bit later on about smartphone and apps and the RYA, there is an RYA um, example which is Safe Tracks, which I think is different names in different countries um, and that then is sending alerts back to people on shore so you can get that running off your smartphone and then of course talked earlier about that personal locator beacon critical thing for that is um, a little bit more expensive um, but um, they need to be registered your device needs to be registered with your rescue service so um, that's important to do okay so had a little bit of look at some of the forms of communications the key thing is always to have a minimum of two forms of communication on your boats so let's touch on signing in or signing out, should I say, signing out onto the water and then signing in when you return to land. There are three different methods that, that are commonly used. The first one, which is really a sign out sheet, the name of the boat, the number of people in the boat, where you're going and when you're going to be back. It's as simple as a book that's inside the um, boathouse um, and you just fill it in and fill it out as you go as you go and when you come back. Then there's another another more, um, slightly more um, real-time response, which is um, making sure that there's a responsible person on shore that has the information, the same information that would be in the book, shared with that person. It could be shared with them with a text message. And I, I shared um, earlier uh, the float plan that was done on the phone, the example of the float plan that was done on the phone. That could easily just be texted to the responsible person on shore. And it's that person's response that's really important that when you return, that you make contact with that responsible person so they can um, downgrade and not need to go looking for you if you um, if you don't return at your estimated return time. In some in, in I know that in Wales, they sometimes use this um, responsible person on shore also guides the crew in as they return to the beach just so that they can come in on a, a steady bit of beach. And then the third one, it's what I was talking about earlier, which is um, where you would pr be using a smartphone and be using a, um, a, a app. Um, and there are growing numbers of apps, um, location apps on the, on the internet that you can download and put on your phone. They basically log your trip and they will uh, make a, they will make contact with somebody if you overrun your return time. So, and there's, it's really worth looking into those and um, to make sure you know what the limitations of those are. So three different examples, simple signing in and out sheet, a responsible person on shore, 
or a electronic app on your smartphone. So we're at the point now where opportunity for you to do a little bit of work. So this is the float plan task and your task is to write a float plan for an endurance training session. Location, it's your choice. I advise you to choose somewhere that you know, somewhere that you potentially row from every day. Time, my suggestion is let's go for 10 a.m. tomorrow. Rowers, you've got four experienced rowers. The boats you've got are two double skulls and a coach boat, so that's great. You can go a little bit more off because you've got an additional support boat there. Um, the aim of the session is to get in some downwind rowing, so practicing picking up the waves and some racing turns. So opportunity to find some boys out on the out on the sea to to race do race turns around, or you could take your own boys where you probably need a little bit more shallow water to to drop the anchors into. So the duration of the session sixty minutes. So that's your task. What other bits of research and information are you likely to need? Well, I suspect you'll need a marine chart or Google Earth. You need a good weather forecast, wind guru or windy, um, tide tables. Um, if, the, if you need any tidal flow information, if they're coming out of a river or an estuary. Um, and also, do you need to check your marine authority website if you've got commercial traffic around shipping? You know, if there are any notice to mariners and anything else that you think you might need to know. For example, potentially there is um, pollution in your area or if there is a um, high UV content predicted. OK, so you've got a task. My suggestion, try and see whether you can do it in 15 minutes. Um, if not, um, get out there and enjoy the task. So thank you. We're getting to the end of the session now. What did we do? We now know what a float plan is and what goes into a float plan. We know we have an in we've had an introduction to some of the navigational hazards that are out there on the sea. We've explored some different means of calling for help. We've looked at three different types of signing in and signing out or signing out and signing in. Really depends which way you're looking at it. And we've set up the task for building the float plan. So if you need more information, it's a lot more information out on the website. Um, you can click in predicts tides and tidal predictions and on, onto the internet you get loads of really great bits of information. Um, Windy, remember I talked about that weather app. Windy Navi Navionics is a marine chart app that you can get if I show you what it looks like. Yep, here you go. Um, so you can have a little download that onto your phone. It gives you a lot of that tidal information, if you, especially if you're in a complex area. Um, we talked about Windy. Here we go. It gives you um, compu um, computer generated wind anywhere in the world. Your lo remember, your local Met office may actually be better. So always be aware of the difference between the predicted um, and the actual um, local experts in forecasting. So, more information on the voyage, on the coal regs, on how to use marine radios. And don't forget, we've got lots, we're building great examples of float plans in the coaches toolkit. Hey, well done on completing another session. If you like what you've heard and you want to tell us stories and share videos with us, pop them in the comments below. If you want to learn more about events in coastal rowing and what's going on, in the community, head over to worldrowing.com. See you later, take care.